Hey, it's Keith Tomasek. You're listening to the Performers Podcast, a podcast about the creative process and people whose lives depend upon it. On today's episode, actor and Intermission Magazine columnist Tony Napo. Tony was preparing for Coal Mine Theater's production of the Pulitzer Prize winning drama Cost of Living when everything changed. We talk about acting, addiction, and parenting. My interview with Tony Napo is coming up. But before we get to the interview, I want, I'm thinking about you. How are you doing? How's it going out there? Are you isolating alone or with your family? If you are with your family, are you getting to know them a little better? You know, are you spending more time together? Are you thinking, who are these people? What happened to that little angel child I raised? I was I was in uh, self isolation in the basement for fourteen days, and uh, I'm so happy to be out. But boy, it was odd getting back to the world, and, and it, in fourteen days, everything changed so much. But it was great to spend more time with my son Cole when I got out. Uh, but he's a teenager now, so if you have little ones around, cherish these moments. You know the smiles, those loud laughs that the little ones do, and the quiet moments like uh, reading in bed. Reading in bed was so much fun. I did that every night with Cole. And uh, anyway, just be grateful for those moments that you have together now. I also want to say thanks to my last guest, Bruce Dow. Bruce, he had this upbeat, great mindset despite losing his job on Broadway. And that mindset was a breath of fresh air. And I received a few emails after that episode of people saying, thanks so much. I want to read a couple. I didn't tell them I was going to read them, so I'm just going to use their initials. This is from uh, JS. Here's what JS wrote. I am an international student and I live by myself. I began to take precautionary measures last Wednesday because something in my gut told me that things weren't right. I haven't had a face-to-face conversation with another person since last Wednesday and I'm indefinitely separated from my family because the border is closed. All of this has been unbelievably challenging. Thank you for sending a little positivity out this morning. Stay well and stay sane. Sincerely, J.S. Thank you, J.S. I appreciate that, and I've passed these along to Bruce Dow, of course, as well. Here's another one. This is from V.S. Thanks for the email, V.S., I feel sad about what is happening to all of us, especially all the great artists in the world and here in Canada. It reminded me of my time in my hometown, Sarajevo, 1992. I was a prompter in the opera, and one day, it was Saturday, all the streets in town were happy, a beautiful spring day. Next day, gunshots and empty streets. Hope it won't last long here, and we'll enjoy beautiful performances, and everyone We'll go back to the jobs they love. That's from VS. Thank you, VS, for sharing that with me. Uh, well, big perspective there. Sarajevo, 1992. As you said, hopefully this won't last long. Anyway, you can uh, email me. i love to hear from you. KeithThomasek at gmail.com. I do read them all, and I do get back to most of them, or all of them, actually. KeithThomasek at gmail.com. So back to my guest, Tony Napo. I was reading another one of his Napaholics columns on intermissionmagazine.ca, and I remembered how much I enjoy his sense of humor, his no bullshit perspective on things. I also have to give you a warning if you've got little ears hanging around, maybe don't listen to this podcast with the little ones because there is a fair amount of explicit language as he takes us through his life. I also have to let you know, I recorded this almost two years ago, and I'm just, you know, we all have our weird headspace. I don't know why, but I just haven't published it. Sometimes, uh, I don't know. I'm happy to get it out to you now. And Tony takes us back to the time his drug problems first started, just as he was finding success in the Toronto film and TV business. But before that, we talk about getting old. You know, I, t- I turned fifty, and uh, in February, and when I turned fifty, I was I wasn't feeling great, and uh, and I thought, you know, fifty is like uh, the decade or the the decade in my life or, or one's life when people start to die. Yeah, and uh, and I thought, you know, 
the people who die in their 50s, I look a lot like those guys. Well, I've, <laughs> I've never met you before, but you're a, you're a hard-living guy. Yeah. And when I met you, I'm like, he doesn't look like a hard-living guy. <laughs> no, I feel, I feel much better. I've been, I've, I've been trying to pay attention to my diet yeah. for a while. Yeah. Now this fasting thing's helped, and the yeah. next step would be to actually do some exercise. Which That's me too. I'm the same. You know what? There's three things, and you figured it out too. Exercise, diet, and mindset. Yeah. Uh, my whole life, because I have Crohn's disease, I've worked on diet. But to the detriment of exercise and mindset, yeah, yeah, yeah. the mindset is. Yeah, but you're lean as a motherfucker. You that doesn't mean I'm healthy. Anything. That's the big misconception. Well, that's, that's true. The big misconception, that's true. right? Right, it's right. It's a big misconception. It's so bizarre. Well, let's talk about because I, you know, I came to know you through like so many people through Intermission Magazine first, yep. where you do the column and everything. Yeah. But I don't know anything about you. Where you're born in Scarborough? I grew right? up in Scarborough. Yeah. And what did your folks do? My foot, not and nothing. My dad was a tool and die maker. Oh, that's and he, pretty uh, serious. But he fell ill when I was uh, about eight, and uh, I was told he was going to die, and everybody was flying in from Italy to say goodbye, and so on and so forth, and then he didn't. Um, and, then, and then fast forward to when I was 25, he needed a new liver. He had scler sclerosis, sclerosis of the liver, and, uh, and he was like at the very final stages. He was yellow. Oh, wow. And... Uh, and, you know, really at death's door again. And he got a transplant. And uh, and now it's 25 years later, and he's still fucking alive. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, anyway, so he retired from that. And So what did they do to make ends meet when you were growing up? We, we had government assistance. My mom worked. My mom always worked. Um, she worked at Woolco. She worked at Walmart. She didn't have, I think she had maybe a grade... 10 education or something i don't i don't actually remember but yeah they neither of them were educated but uh but you know they were they were good parents so your mom was the breadwinner in the family is that what it sounds like well to whatever degree i mean she uh she was everything in the family she was the nurse to my dad she was uh she raised us she worked she cooked she cleaned she yeah. she did it all i remember my dad tried to make toast one time while she was at work, and it was just like a fucking disaster. <laughs> you no, know, he has no, no, I don't even know if he knows where the kitchen is. And did you, see, I grew up, my folks were split up, and I didn't even know that my dad was proud of me till <laughs> I, I was later in life. And I'll right. never forget, I was in Hong Kong. He was a big businessman in Hong Kong. And I had gone to visit him, and I'm driving with a stranger you know, one of his buddies taking me somewhere. And he guy, the guy said to me, uh, oh, because I was doing magic in Hong Kong. I was in a big hit. <laughs> it was like a big hit in Hong Kong. In the front page of the entertainment section of the paper there, and the, uh, the old guy that I don't even know with his British accent driving in the Jag is like, oh, you know, your dad is very, very, your father is very, very proud of you. And I'm like, well, that's odd. <laughs> like, I couldn't relate to that at all. So it sounds like you had that right away. Yeah, no, I had it right away, and but it but uh, it didn't manifest itself in any kind of good feeling. You know, my dad was really when I was young, he was just scream at me on the way home from hockey and scream. He was just a yeller, yeah, yeah. a real fucking yeller about what you didn't do right or what. How, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So was ever and he always focused on. You know, it was funny thing about my dad is like it was always like he loved me and he believed in me and he really pushed me hard, but uh, but. The the way he expressed it was always fucked up. You know, he'd be like, uh, I, later on in life, I'd say like, Dad, I'm, uh, oh yeah, we're we're going skiing this weekend. He's like, you can't ski, <laughs> right? No matter what I said, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm water skiing this weekend. You can't water ski. So was there ever a moment where you had that click and you go, you know what? He actually does. This. He's on my side, hundred percent, and all that. Or did yeah, you? it's just like you know, I grew up in a house where. Like people never said I love you, right? You know, you just sort Same of thing, felt yeah. Yeah. you felt loved. Yeah. I had, yeah. I never felt like I wasn't loved. Yeah, I just felt like he he was pushing me, and I knew he was pushing me because you know I'm kind of a lazy fucker, and if somebody doesn't push me, I I won't do anything. But um, you know, even later in life, and my family, like when you when you go to my parents' place, the TV is always on. <laughs> they wake up and turn it on. And it's on until they go to bed. And that's how I grew up. Yeah. So so whenever we weren't doing something, you know, I grew up in a two-bedroom apartment. We watched TV. 
Yeah. You know, so for me to end up on TV, I know, <laughs> is kind of cool. You know, my mom was excited. Shoot the messenger, I did, and uh, I asked my dad uh, after the first episode I was in. I said, "What did you think?" He goes, "You look fat." Oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so they so just bizarre, never. Eh? You know, it's not like a. Nobody cuddled me, yeah, you know, when yeah. I was a kid. Which I'm up. doing with my kid, and you're probably doing with yours. Totally, totally. I spoiled the shit out of <laughs> yeah, her. Exactly. Same here. We both have single or one uh, only children. Yeah, and it's the like, exact telling them I love you all the time, constantly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. constantly. Like every every more than once in a conversation. Every time I see her, every time we <laughs> That's part. So yeah, I text it to her. I had yeah. to text. I came here this morning to see you. I left the house at six thirty. My little guy was asleep. I was going to text him at 8. It's, he's 12, just turning 12 tomorrow. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to text him. He's fine. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. He's a, what's he going to say? I'm okay, Dad. I'm having breakfast, Dad. I'm right. like, okay, I'll just give him space. He's probably he's excited because his mom's away too. He's all by himself okay. in the house. I'm like, he'll be fine. The other thing is I'm scared. Maybe you're there already. We still get by with hand-me-downs from people. He hasn't asked for any expensive right. clothes or anything. I'm like, oh, oh no, not my kid. Oh, not is that my right? Kid. It's all fucking Sephora. Oh, Sephora. Oh, yeah. The you girls. Know, all the makeup. It's so and, expensive, uh, eh? It's crazy expensive. And a phone. I bet she's got a phone, too. Of course she's got a phone. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that yet. The We're phone over. is the only way we, uh, uh, of punishing her at all is taking the phone away. That's all I can do. I'm like, yeah, you, you can do whatever you want, but I'll take the phone oh, away. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's pretty much it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Have you used the this is my house line? <laughs> yeah, this is no. my, not this. It's no. my bedroom. Well, it's my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she, uh, it, when we're together, it's amazing. Like we're, we actually just are, it just, things have just shifted. And she's at this, I want to hang out with my friends. Of age. course. Yeah. And that's never come up. So, you know, we're, we're transitioning into a new yeah, routine, period now yeah. where, you know, mostly I'm a, a chauffeur in a bank machine. Right. Yeah. Um, they, you know, a funny thing was uh, towards the beginning of this uh, two week period, uh, we were going to go see a movie and uh, she wanted to see Oceans. Yeah. 13 or whatever. Eight, uh, yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah, the one with the, the women, women. Of yeah. course. And I didn't like the other fucking Oceans <laughs> no, movies, but I was like, yeah, okay, I'll take you. <laughs> And then she got a text from a friend saying, um, can you hang out? And she's like, oh, dad, is it okay if I go hang out with uh, her friend? Oh, there's a little moment there. And I said, um, yeah, sure, why didn't you just ask her if she wants to come to the movie with us? And she literally went, <laughs> oh, dad, no. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, we don't hang out with parents, dad. I was like, all right, well. Yeah, I get that whatever. already. I get that too. Uh, yeah. That's tough, eh? God. It was tough. Oh, I'm sure. It's like it getting dumped and basically getting yeah, dumped. Yeah, yeah. I was already for our date, and she was like, no, I'm not coming. That's hard. Yeah, but it's fine. You and know, then you're waiting for her to I come. Once I wrap my head around it, it's no, like, but yeah, still. of course she wants to hang out with her friends. Yeah, yeah. She goes to Newfoundland with her mom yeah. every summer, so she's there now. But then you're waiting for her to come back, too. Are you, or have you got to the point where you can fall asleep? Yeah, fuck her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I miss her a lot, and we talk... Uh, we oh talk on the phone God. and text every day. She she actually crank called me this morning. Oh, that's sweet. I like that. I don't that. know how the hell that's so sweet. she did that. Did she get you? It, well, it was some guy saying like the, the credit card that didn't come through for the three pizzas that, and uh, first of all, it's 10 in the morning. Like who would order a pizza in the morning? I'm like, no, nah, I think you got the wrong number. It's not my pizza. And he's like, and he just keeps saying, yeah, well, the credit, credit card is declined. We need somebody to pay for the pizza. And I said, you know what? It's not my pizza. Fuck off. And hung up. <laughs> and then she called back and said, Dad, actually, that was us. Oh. We were crank calling you. Well, that's and, pretty uh, sweet. Uh, well, that was a good one. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I'm kind of busy right now. No, that's, that's, uh... <laughs> oh, so let me ask you a question. So how do you deal? Because you're very public about your, your, your past and your drug issues yeah. and all that. How does, does she know about that? How she does, knows everything, yeah. So how do you cross that bridge with a kid? Like, when did that come up? Uh, I don't know. I, I couldn't give you a, a I couldn't give you a Do you time remember thinking, day. wow, this is going to hit me one day or is this part of the deal? You know, I guess it's No, part no, of the deal, it's right? like, uh, uh, I don't know. When, whenever she asks any question, I give her an honest answer. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if she brought it up or I brought it up, but she knows, uh, and also everything, you know, if you Google me, yeah. it's all there. Yeah. You know, I've done pretty extensive interviews with uh, with uh, Kelly at The Globe and uh, and with Glenn Sumi at Now. Yeah. And so it's all there for her to find anyway. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I just told her because, you know, going into high school next year, you know, I'm like, you got to be careful. Fentanyl's out there. Oh. Like, she knows everything. So you know? much bad. She stuff. knows all the shit that's going on. Yeah. And, uh, I'm just like, I showed her documentaries about like yeah. girls who had been raped by their friends and committed suicide and families that had to leave town and stuff. And I'm like, just, you know, be super careful. And, and if you do fuck up, no matter where you are, call me. Yeah. Come. Yeah. I'll yeah. never, you'll never get in trouble for being drunk or high. Yeah. But, uh, but our parents say that, but did you ever do that with your parents? I call, I call my dad used to come get me. I, I didn't, wow. I didn't do drugs when I was young at all, but I drank a lot of beer. Yeah. In Scarborough. And, uh, you know, I'd be, I could be passed out when we didn't have cell phones. Sure. Yeah. So you had to find a pay phone yeah. <laughs> and be like, dad, come get me. I'm fucked up. And my dad always came and got that's me. That's pretty cool. But you know, that's like, I'm we're talking about 16, 17. This yeah. is later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everything starts earlier nowadays. I think so. Oh, yeah. for sure. Well, that's pretty good. So that's, yeah, I didn't have that. I mean, you know, to be honest, because of the Crohn's disease, I didn't do anything like that till yeah. much later in life. I, had to, I was really afraid of getting sick. So I had, a, I was around all, you name it, I was around it. And right. I'm like, no, thanks. No, thanks. I was pretty, uh, yeah. I think she's, uh, you know, it's already around. I know oh, that it's I, already yeah, around her. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, you know, the, I try to encourage her to stay away from alcohol and any kind of heavy drugs at all. Yeah. I think at some point in time, I'll be like, you know, just do pot. <laughs> right. If you're going to do it's something. Yeah. It's legal. My kid's about. scared to death of drugs. I was scared to death of drugs. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally understand that. Huh. I was terrified of drugs. When I was young, my friends, you know, my friends would smoke weed and hash and shit all the time. And I might have, I might have tasted it a little bit, but it was terrifying to me. So what was the turning point? Um... Well, I started to do well in uh, in film and TV here in Toronto, and uh, I won't name any names, but I started to hang out with people who, you know, also did really well. And, and at the time, this is like the end of the 80s, early 90s, that's what everyone was doing. Yeah, just you know? cocaine I'd, everywhere. Yeah, I'd go yeah. meet and hang out, and it was just around. And... Uh, and I was like, well, if that's what everyone's doing, that's I'm going to really do, do it. Oh, you'd you know? be the best at it. Yeah, I'm going to commit myself to this. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, fast forward, there was a lot of fun times in the beginning, and then and then they just stopped. Yeah. You know, it wasn't yeah. fun anymore at all. It was fucking killing me. Yeah, literally. And so I don't know enough about your story to know how you managed, because it's in inspirational that you're, you move forward. Was there any trigger that helped you stop? Um, other than, you know, the birth, I've heard the birth of your daughter, yeah. but that's, that's all very philosophical. I'll tell you, buddy, years ago, uh, someone that I was involved with had a problem and we were talking and they had been talking about doing something and never did anything, you know, just went on and on. And finally we were having breakfast and I'm like, look, if you're serious, we're going to a narc, whatever, narc anonymous meeting. Yeah. And the person's like, we're like literally, we were actually cooking. Yeah. And the person's like, okay. Right. And we went. Right. And I didn't know what the hell to think. And that person didn't know what to think. And I was kind of like inspired by everybody telling their stories. Sure. That person was scared shitless. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and credits that moment for stopping them. Yeah. I wasn't scared because I had nothing, I guess. But so was there a moment ever in your life where you were like, this is the moment I remember? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, I remember it well. I, I was, I had been, uh, I think I'd been high for like four or five days, maybe six days without sleeping or without eating. And, uh, and I thought I'm going to, you know, I, I had an ounce of Coke and, uh, and I think there was, there was some left, yeah. you know? And I remember just thinking, if I do the rest of this, I think I'll probably die. Um, so I called some friends to come help me and, uh, and I called my mom and I said, wow. like, I'm really fucked up. And, uh, and she called to find out, you know, what, what, what could be done. And she found me, you know, some names to call and I call people and, and I ended up, uh, went in for 21 days in a, in a rehab facility in Brooklyn, Ontario. It's a renaissance house. Uh, so I did my 21 days in there and I came out and, you know, it was pretty good for a couple of years. And, um, and then I started to have slips and, you know, so, some, some pretty big slips. And, uh, 
and almost fucked my whole career up and almost fucked, you know, my life was already fucked up. Um, but then just, you know, started, there's always people, as long as I can call people for help. Right, right. And there's a huge network of people to call for help. I'll be okay. But, um, you know, the tendency of an addict is to not call for help. Of course. You know, yeah. I just want to hide and yeah. pretend it doesn't exist and hope it goes away. And and my little bit of understanding, um, and I just got this from, I'm a fan of uh, Jeff Tweedy and Wilco, and I was reading about his, because he, he was messed up seriously. So he sure. did the same thing. He went on a rehab clinic for 21 days, yeah. but then he needed a doctor to help him on the day-to-day maintenance stuff. Right. Did you do that as well? I guess that's the hard part is finding that. Well, in the kind beginning of a, I went to meetings. Yeah. I hate meetings. I just hate them. They just depress the fuck out of me. Yeah. Um, but they work for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I remember I would, I would go to meetings. Um, I would go to meetings and then go see a dealer after the meetings, you know, at, at certain points sure. in time. Yeah. So the meetings didn't help me because I was just bullshitting. Right. You know? I was just yeah. trying to convince. Well, especially as an actor. Yeah. yeah. Just trying to convince everyone I was okay. Yeah. And of course, you know, the cliche, I was lying to myself, yeah. but, uh, I did a couple of out programs at Cam H after I started, when I started fucking up outpatient programs. And then, uh, uh, yeah, I just I just have to always keep an eye on it. You know, it's not a thing that goes away. It's not. No, no, I hear you. It's a yeah. uh, it's a struggle more times than others. I've gone through periods where where I fucked up and and got myself back together. And you know, if uh, the, the key for me is if I tell someone I fucked up, then I'm accountable. Right. And then it's and then I can at least work towards yeah, yeah. not fucking up. Yeah. If I keep it a secret. I'm fucked. Yeah. You know, because, yeah. uh, because, uh, you know, an addict left to their own devices is never going to stop using. So we're, yeah. we're in, in Jim Milan's house. This is Jim Milan's house. Yeah. And you talked a little bit earlier about one of the times you fucked up. Was that, the, yeah, when Jim, you were... Jim is a, Jim is a guy who started Crow's theater and, uh, I did a couple of shows for them. And one of the shows I was doing for them, I, I just didn't show up for a performance. For a performance. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, people came over to where I was and I was a fucking disaster. And I worked out a deal with Jim cause he could have fired me and uh, the show wasn't doing all that well anyway. So he could have fired me and, and put, uh, put it all on me. And he didn't, we worked out a deal where my ex-wife who I was still friends with came and essentially babysat me for 24 hours a day. She, I was not left alone during the production too. The thing was that it happened twice. The, f- the first time it happened on a Sunday, I, I was like, Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'll be fine. We'll get through this. And then it happened a second time on a Sunday. And what was it? Was it, was it two things? Yeah. What was the physical thing? Was it alcohol or drugs? Yeah. And then the second thing, what do you think was making you not want to be on stage? I don't think anything wanted me to not be on stage. Uh, you know, the, the thing about, uh, addictive thought is it doesn't think about anything but drugs in the moment yeah yeah so it's just like there's drugs in front of me yeah. i'm gonna do them yeah and then uh and then when they run out you fucking crash and you cry yeah, yeah. and you yeah, missing a show is a pretty reality big deal, though. comes back and like, like not missing a show fucking up the show for everybody yeah yeah totally i went back you know after i missed the first show i went back and apologized sincerely to everyone in tears and uh and then i did the exact same thing again a week later wow and um, and that's when the babysitter was called, and and I made it through the rest of the run, and then then I went right into another uh, program after that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, Jim and, could have ended my career, and um, he didn't. And now I live in his house. Did you know him? Did you know him well at the time before that, or was yeah, it a, as well as I knew anyone yeah, to yeah. say hello to and yeah. you know hang out with a bit? We had already done a show together. This was the second show we did together. Um. Yeah, no, he's just a really oh, good cool. guy. And, yeah. You know, people were really good to me. People like me for whatever fucking reason and were happy to give me a second chance. I guess also because I I did seek help and I did, right. yeah. you know, I was trying. Uh, it's just hard to explain addiction to people like when, you know, when you read about Philip Seymour Hoffman or oh my gosh, Amy yeah. Winehouse or yeah, whatever, yeah. Like, why would they do that? And it's like, they did that because that's what they had to do. You know, you, you, drug addicts, it, it's amazing how selective your thinking thinking can be, you know, and how you can lie to yourself every fucking time. 
it's the exact same thing, but you think, oh, no, this will it's be different. different. Yeah. This will be different. Yeah. You yeah. Know, the definition of insanity. And have you got that touchstone now? Does Jim serve as that for you? Or is Jim's that a, great. Jim yeah. and his wife, Kira, are really yeah. good to me, and their their children are, you know, like, I'm like Uncle Tony who lives <laughs> right. under the stairs. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of people in my life I can call on. I don't like to call on people. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit too proud, probably. And, uh, and a bit too secretive, probably, you know, I just definitely don't want things to get out sometimes, but I've been, I've been really healthy now for a while. And well, yeah, like I said, you look great and you're taking yeah, care. It's funny that you mentioned secretive because I consider myself to be a private person, but you're completely out there, right? It's funny how that, well, I'm that completely dichotomy out there, but you know, that's what everyone says. Oh, how you doing? You look so good. Everything looks good on Facebook. I'm yeah, like, what yeah, the yeah. fuck am I going to put on Facebook? <laughs> no, no, I, I, you know, me puking in a driveway. Here, this Here's me fucked up. <laughs> Flashback Thursday or whatever the fuck it is. But even just talking for like, you know, even, but, but you're willing to share. What do you, you're willing to, you, at some point you made a conscious choice. I'm going to be public about this. I think what you're talking about is a, is a, is a byproduct of of just wanting to be accountable yeah, and wanting yeah. to be uh, open with everyone and and you know there was still even even after I had done rehab there was still always suspicion you know right, like, right, my right. nose is fucked I've got a hole right through my oh, nose wow. I yeah. have one nostril now yeah and so I constantly have to blow it and yeah. clean it and do shit and every other thing and. Uh, and, you know, in the beginning, people would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's still oh, doing it, course. he's still doing right. it. Or if I had to piss more than once, it's like, oh, he's going to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> right. I was like, yeah, whatever. Get like, I can't, yeah. Yeah. I can't, you know, everyone's entitled to have those thoughts because I deserve them. Um, so I guess I just put myself out there at some point in time more than most. Right. Because uh, for that, for that reason, I guess. But also... Uh, uh, somewhere along the way, it just became part of my thing, you know, like mm. online media in the beginning was just fun yeah, to, to yeah. like talk to people yeah. and get in touch with people. And then uh, at a certain point in time, I, I noticed, you know, I, I think I, I had become a bit of a voice oh, in the sure. community, you yeah. know, over certain things before the Napaholics column came out. And uh, and there would be like great discussions on my page and blah blah blah. So I became kind of a uh, somebody. I don't know what this is from, but somebody told me the a connector. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? So yeah. I connect people. people yeah. Because I'm 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 like a yeah a catalyst or whatever. Um, yeah. A cog like, one of those. Uh, well, whatever the middle thing is <laughs> in the spokes sure. of a bicycle. Yeah. Right? The hub or something. Like the that. hub. Yeah. yeah. So like people from different worlds come, come in. into my world and. And, yeah, you know, discussions take place, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Yeah. And, um, and I just, uh, I don't know, I think I, I try to just be, you know, authentic is a big oh, word. Oh, that's the big one for right. Napaholics. It's yeah, insane. Yeah, I try yeah. to be authentic in my work and in my life. Yeah. You know, to whatever degree I can be. What did you learn? So Napaholics, what did you learn about yourself by doing a weekly column that makes people think and laugh at the same time. Um, Which is a great thing, by the way. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. It's easy to make people laugh. Sometimes you can make people... And I shouldn't say that. It's not easy to... It's not always easy to make people laugh, so that's a gift. But to make them laugh and think at the same time is huge. And that's what you do with the column. Thanks. Thank you for that. It's Um, true. What what did you learn about yourself going through that process? Well, I don't... I'm not entirely sure what I learned about myself, but I, maybe to some degree, you know, the, it, it's all, you know, from acting s- classes in the beginning to acting school to a career to this column. Yeah. It's all uh, a process of discovering yourself. Right. And, and, you know, post rehab, uh, there was a lot about, a lot of my focus was on taking the mask off and uh, laying myself at the mercy of of people, you know, and their forgiveness and and generosity was there. And then, um, and then it was, you know, uh, part of the real, realization in rehab is like you're a 
you're trying to please people. You always want to please people, and and you <laughs> oh don't. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you don't. Uh, I, sorry, first person. I don't actually have a personality. I, my personality will is malleable and will shift to accommodate whatever, whatever the fuck you want it to right, be. Right. You know, I can be a tough guy. I can be a smart guy. Sure. I can be a dumb guy. Yeah. I can be, uh, you know, at the time I, I was a bit of a, a womanizer. Sure. Yeah. Um, I can be, uh, you know, I can be anything. Yeah. Uh, but none of it was real, you know, it was put on. And, uh, or some of it was real, whatever. Oh, I hear you, I hear you. I sometimes get bored listening to myself. But, um, so, find, so finding yourself. So the, the But column- then I started to realize, like, I don't need to say the thing everyone else is saying. I don't need to think what everyone else is thinking. And I don't need to fucking apologize for, for either of those things. And, and so I just began to, as I, as I stopped, you know, whatever the shame is or whatever the pain is or whatever the misery it is that I carry inside of me, kind of existential angst or whatever, um, I just started to discover my own authentic voice. Yeah. And... Um, that's, that's how it sounds so easy, eh? But uh, it's it's no it's, no it's, it's not easy. That thing. that's what yeah. I'm saying. Like you, you know, just because of course I still want people to like of, me, especially because now you're everyone loves it. So now there's an expectation, right? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like you know, at some point the realization that like people actually do like me. I don't have to pretend to be. Oh, very. And good. I think the 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 linchpin or the key to the whole thing is. Uh, if people don't like me, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I don't honestly don't yeah. give a fuck. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't want to, you know, like I had a beef at Soul Pepper with Schultz back in the day who, you know, before yep. all the shit hit the fan. And I was like, I don't give a fuck if Soul Pepper ever hires me. Right. I don't give a fuck if, uh, I, I don't give a fuck. You know, what's the worst anyone can do in theater? Not hire me? <laughs> You're doing me a fucking favor. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually doing me a favor. Like, that's a terrible addiction too, theater, <laughs> because I want to fucking do it, but it's killing me. Killing you just because it's... Uh, it's killing me because it doesn't pay anything. It doesn't pay in Canada. You yeah. Know? And also nobody gives a shit. And Well, you know, well... Uh, well, the know. people who do give a shit, give a shit. Yeah. But nobody else gives a shit. No. It's a very small percentage. You know, you think like you're doing a play and I don't think most of the audiences... I mean, there's a lot of great people and a lot of great theater goers um you know i'm not trying to shit on them at all but uh sometimes i think like people don't even know a good play from a bad play people don't know a good actor from a bad actor yeah and you know what i love rehearsing a play a lot more than i love performing a play because well, you're working it out and it's an experiment yeah, it's all research right, and it's exciting course, when course. you find that yeah. moment or yeah. it's exciting to watch other people yeah. on stage do work you know i had just gotten to the the place where People that I really admire and and respect a lot wanted to work with me, you know, and that's and that's uh, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty big draw right there. Like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm gonna do check off with Chris Abrams and his amazing right company. You know, of course I am, and and of course I want to be in at Can stage or and then you're booked and you can't take a film role that'll pay five times as much yeah, <laughs> in two then days. You're fucked, you're fucked yeah. for three months. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're fucking that way. Sure, the uh, you know the the nourishment it gives your soul and the satisfaction you get. You know, you're playing. You know, I was playing uh, hockey with Gretzky out there. You know, like right, this, there's right. fucking David Fox. There's on and on and on, and and they just made me. You know, my my criteria for doing theater was like, am I going to be a better actor for having done this? Right. And that's not my criteria for film. It's just like, I'll do fucking anything. <laughs> right. Hire me and I'll do anything. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't want to be, Show I me won't the do money. a rapist and I won't do a pedophile, but I'll do almost anything right, else, right, right. you know? Yeah. And, and uh, it's busy now because Toronto's booming, right? It's busy now and yeah. I'm 50 now yeah. and I'm finally the right that's interesting. age right. There's... for my type, you right. know? Like I wasn't Johnny Depp or George Clooney when I was young, you know? I was just a a big fucking meathead looking guy with a, and I was in pretty good shape and now I'm an old man, but I'm like the old weathered grizzly motherfucker who's been around the cock, clock, cock. I almost said, <laughs> I've been around the cock. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. 
But, you know, it's like I've been around and I'm miserable and life is shit and it stinks and I hate it. And, like, I play that guy really well. Uh, and that's uh, – and I'm also at, like, my dad. You know, like, I'm, I'm playing people's dads now. And right. I'm playing – You can probably have fun with that. Yeah. I mean, I'm very castable. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can, I'm, I'm, I can do blue collar. I can do comedy. I can do – today I have my first – Sex scene oh. um, this afternoon, actually. Uh-oh. In wow. fact, yeah, my first uh, nudity rider. Have they told you, what, oh, what, tell me about the nudity rider. Uh, I, they put a sock on my dick. That's all I know. So it's a uh, it's a sex scene, and it's uh, I probably can't say anything about it. What literally it a sock on your dick? You're not wearing one of those like a dance cup with the thing up your ass? I don't think so because you'll see my ass. Like, it's, Jeez. it's, it's got to be something that yeah, you yeah. look naked in. Yeah. So tell me about. Preparing for your first sex scene. That's a. I, don't, do you, I didn't really do anything to prepare for it. I yeah, just show up. Shower. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a shower and shave your back, brush hairs. my teeth. Yeah, <laughs> that's about it. I don't do a lot of preparing for film right. and TV. Yeah, uh, I just like to show up and see what happens. You know, I know the lines more or less. Yeah, but a lot of time those are going to change by the time you get there, so it's a waste of time to learn them. And it's a waste of time to learn them. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I'm doing this. That's sh- hilarious. I, I, I was going to tell you a story, but I won't. No, no. What is it? No, 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 no. You can change something, so I won't know. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, but anyway, when you get to set 90, 90% of the time, 80% of you the time. You work through stuff. And- yeah, you're going to change the dialogue. So, And you only do one scene at a time. It's not like a play. So I can learn, you know, I could probably learn four or five pages and. 20 minutes if I had to. Are you good like that? Yeah. I'm really good like that. That That's... muscle is so fucking strong. Um, yeah. Because you're, because, you know, I'm auditioning for three, you know, depends. Two, yeah, you're two trained. To, two to five yeah. or six times a week. Yeah. And you got to learn them and drop them, learn them and drop them, learn them and drop them, go on to the next one. But that's that's impressive. And that is a muscle that's so, as I, the, the directors that I speak to, that's their biggest beef as people. I was laughing because it sounded like you don't have them down when you get there. So you do, but you just don't need to worry about it. I have an it. idea of yeah. what they are yeah. or what I'm going to change them to. You know, I do yeah. I do that a lot. I change the stuff in the script and... And uh, most of the time, they just let you do that. Yeah. Sometimes they're like, don't do that. So, Tony, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, for sure. Thank I appreciate you. it. I've learned. I mean, I'm as a father, I don't get to bond enough with people who are living outside of the norm. So I really it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's really uh, it's really helpful for me to do that. And I'm sure there's you know, there's a lot more of us out there, too. Very cool. And I can't wait to uh, read the next column. Thank you, brother. Well, there you go, uh, Mr. Tony Napo. Thank you, Tony, so much for uh, inviting me into your home and and being so open and candid about your relationship and also about uh, your personal problems with uh, addiction. And, um, you know, now's the time when some of these things can rear up their ugly heads when we're alone, when we're void of any routine in our lives. So uh, if you are struggling, anybody... Just reach out, you know, there's always, as Tony said, I loved it when he said, as long as he's in touch with someone, he's less likely to, to fall off. So keep in touch, everybody. Uh, and if you need to email me, email me for sure. I'm here to help too. Keith Tomasek at gmail.com. Tony's great on Facebook. Look up Tony Napo and I, you, you're going to get a, you'll get a smile. If nothing else, you're going to get a smile because that's just the kind of guy he is. And that's the kind of stuff he puts out there. All my best also to Ted Dykstra and everyone at Coal Mine Theatre. I hope that the production of Cost of Living goes up when this is all over. In the meantime, follow Tony Napo on intermissionmagazine.ca. His weekly column is called Napaholics, always worth a read. And also, please, I'm, this is my request to you, hit the subscribe button on your podcast app, whatever you're listening to. If you subscribe... You'll receive the episodes before they go on my website. You'll get them first. And also, the more subscribers we get, the higher we rank on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, and then more creative people can find us. Be sure to listen to another episode of the Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed this one, check out my interview with Nicholas Campbell. It's a few years back, but Nicholas is another hard-living guy who calls it like he sees it, and like Tony, he's got a great sense of humor. 
Don't forget to subscribe. That's the Performers Podcast, a podcast about the creative process and people whose lives depend upon it. I'm Keith Tomasek. Thanks for listening.